Hi everybody, Dr. Klein here again, and I just wanted to welcome you to week one of the semester. So hopefully you have taken time to look at the syllabus and have looked at the, some of the things that we're going to be doing this semester. Um, in week one, you have two readings, the first chapter of the Howard book and the first chapter of the Carp book. And what I have gone and done, because I know some of you probably have not had the opportunity to buy the books just yet, for the very first week, I have posted the first two lecture, or first two chapters rather for you on Blackboard so that you will have an opportunity to start reading that material. However, this this is the first and only week that I will be doing so. So by week two, I fully expect you to be able to purchase the two books. They're not that expensive. They're available at the bookstore. They're available online at Amazon. And I feel as though at this point you should have them since I already me emailed you on a separate occasion about the fact that you're going to need those two books. So week two, you will also have book readings assigned to you, but you will have online uh, readings that are assigned as well. And those will help you in the formation of your short writing assignments that are due every week and your discussion boards that you must post by weekly as well or I'm sorry twice a week uh, for your first posting and then your secondary posting my mistake <clears throat> So today in lecture, um, I apologize that you're not able to see me um, with the way that the software recording program is going the way that I'm using it. You can either see me or see the material that I am referencing and I figured that you all would probably rather see the material that I'm referencing rather than just seeing me. Um, so this week what I wanted to do was take a few minutes and sort of show you in lecture format what I mean by these weekly topic lectures that you all will have to do. Um, and I will continue to post mini lectures throughout the semester, but this is the type of format that I'm expecting from you all when you post your mini lectures on your weekly topics. And remember that the first one is due um, this Sunday night. So whoever has signed up for the very first one should be gathering information to create a small um, video recording like this one, except I would like to see you all and the software program that I've provided um, has the ability to do that. So this week in this mini lecture, I just want to take a few minutes, maybe about 10, 15 minutes more and talk about judicial review, which was a prominent theme in the first two chapters that you read for me this week. And I'm not going to get too much into the actual judicial review side of it, but uh, specifically I want to focus on how judicial, re judicial review um, really influenced a lot of the different things that were happening during the very first first and into the second um, administration for FDR in particular. Um, so as you guys know, all right, there we go. So as you guys may know from your readings, and this will be elaborated a lot more in the next couple weeks when we, when we finally focus on the Marbury v. Madison case, um, judicial review was established in Marbury v. Madison. And basically what that case did was that it invalidated the Judiciary Act of 1789. If you'll remember from your readings, the Judiciary Act of 1789 was the one that basically established the three branches of government. Um, so I'm not going to go too far into that case because somebody is going to be presenting that in their SCOTUS um, recording for me. But that case basically said that the Supreme Court has the ability to rule on issues. So when we're talking about the FDR um, administration, we're basically talking about all the legislative decision making that took place. So anytime an act or a piece of legislation is pushed through Congress, basically the Supreme Court, as SCOTUS, I will refer to them throughout the semester, SCOTUS has the ability to rule on whether or not that law is constitutional or not. So basically it strengthens the power that SCOTUS has within the government and allows itself to keep these checks and balances in place. And as you guys know, uh, SCOTUS has pretty much had its hands in everything since its establishment and has ruled on everything from something as simple as the price of grain to presidential elections as we saw in the Bush v. Gore decision and everything pretty much in between. And we're going to be talking a lot this semester on the different rules that SCOTUS has put in place. Um, so getting back to the Roosevelt administration, if you guys remember your history, um, 
uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt basically came along at a perfect time in this country um, when the country was at its lowest point financially, when we were in the middle of this Great Depression. So Franklin Delano Roosevelt came through and you're seeing things like a quarter of the country is facing unemployment. They don't know where their next meal is coming from, so they're standing in line at the soup kitchens. We know that they don't have any jobs because a lot of the industrial production has been decreased. And at the time, farmers were not even able to produce enough food or really rather they were producing more than enough food but nobody was able to afford to buy it so a lot of crops were being destroyed and you have things like the dust bowl that was coming through the western part of the country which was um, creating devastation to the lands that were out there um, so if you think about it in comparison to the great recession that we just faced um, in the last handful of years, at the peak of the Great Recession in October 2009, we only faced, and I say only because it's in comparison to what we're looking at here in 1933, we faced a peak unemployment of 10% in October 2009, and that was the height of our Great Recession. So in comparison, the Great Depression had an unemployment rate of 25%, which is arguably a, a, a bigger deal than the 10% that we were facing. So when FDR comes along, he's running on this platform of basically I'm going to fix everything and you do not need to be afraid anymore because the government is here and is going to take care of you. So in his inaugural, inaugural address at his first administration, um, he basically came in and said, I'm going to provide relief. I'm going to provide recovery. I'm going to do it fast and I'm going to reform the government so that something like this does not happen again. And I'm going to do it all in the first 100 days of my new administration. So it sounded great at the time. Um, so when you look at what FDR was actually going to do in his first New Deal in the first 100 days of the very first administration, arguably, he really did get a lot pushed through, right? And he focused beginning on day one on strong communication between the president and Congress trying to get things swept through. And basically, I don't want to say force the hand of Congress, but made sure that Congress was on board and that there was nothing that was going to stand in his way of getting through these sweeping reforms that he wanted to see take place. So within the first 100 days, um, basically he set the precedent and now every other president since FDR has basically been judged on what he could accomplish in his first 100 days in office. So part of what we see taking place is that he's going to regulate the banks, right? So part of the Great Depression, you saw these giant runs on the bank where people were going to the bank trying to get as much money out as they could. And once the paper money was gone, their savings was essentially gone. So in the Glass-Steagall Act, you see that Roosevelt basically put insurance on the bank and now if you walk into a bank you see that the banks are protected by the FDIC up to a certain point so regular checking and savings accounts are insured up to about a hundred thousand dollars so he wanted to make sure that there were no more runs on the bank he wanted to regulate Wall Street to make sure that we didn't have a secondary market crash so occasionally you will see if something big happens the first thing that they do like on 9-11 one of the first things that they do is they close Wall Street to in, in order to protect the market. Um, you will also see that he repealed prohibition. And this was one of the biggest uh, things that he could have done as president because there was so many people that were drinking and they were doing so in a black market sense that the government was not getting any money from the alcohol production um, that you normally would see if prohibition wasn't in place. So he repealed prohibition and the government started getting the tax money that was coming from drinking alcohol because no matter what happens, um, people are still going to want to engage in their vices. So they're still going to drink even if they don't have a job or don't necessarily have money to pay for alcohol. It's still not going to be one of those things that people are willing to give up. So why not get the tax money from it? 
And then finally, one of the other big things that he did was this creation of the Public Works Administration. And basically what this was doing was putting people back to work. And the Public Works Administration was responsible for a lot of the infrastructure that we currently see in this country. Um, so they were basically taking able-bodied young men and women and they were saying, go build this interstate and go build this highway and we need government buildings. And once the government buildings are in place, I need you to paint murals inside them and our country is growing so I need you to create hospitals and school buildings and airports and all these things that were just basic construction jobs just to get money back in the pockets of people which who would then put it back into the economy and would stimulate the economy that much more so it was important in the first 100 days to start getting people back to work um, we also saw things like the Civilian Conservation Corps which was jobs protecting natural resources. Um, so planting trees, that was one of the biggest things because as our country kept building, we were building homes, we were building buildings out of wood for a long time and it was depleting our forest. So just go out and start planting trees and people were paid to dig holes and dig tree and plant trees. The Tennessee Valley Authority was a big initiative which helped to get electricity into parts of the country that were still not in um, houses that had running electricity. So they created dams and they created um, the infrastructure to run electric lines across the country. And the AAA was created in order to um, drive up the price of farming to help farmers. Um, so basically what it did was that um, they allowed farmers to not grow crops and they paid them for it. So if let's say I had a um, hundred acres of land, the government would pay me to leave 75 of my 100 acres barren in an effort to increase the price of crops to save the farmers. Um, so sometimes they would kill off piglets and cows and they would leave crops to rot all in an effort to try and um, boost up the price of crops. And then finally the NRA was created and this is very different than the current NRA that our country has right now. But basically the NRA was created as a way to um, put a stop gap in place so that workers would only ever go down to a minimum wage um, wage at their jobs. They would never go anywhere below it and it was the first creation of a minimum wage which we still see today. There was a regulation on certain work hours so the creation of a 40-hour work week. It was something that never was introduced before now but it was an important gap so that people would get paid they'd be able to go home after 40 hours and have a rest and then somebody else could take on the next shift. So it wasn't requiring people to have to work 70, 80 hours a week for a lower wage to make a decent living. So all of that took place in the first 100 days. Um, the second New Deal came about um, shortly after the first one was concluded and now that the infrastructure was in place for new jobs and minimum wage and all of that stuff, um, President Roosevelt then was able to take it a step further and created things like the WPA, um, which basically expanded the cultural public works in this country. So like I said, once a hospital was created, then people went in and they focused on painting murals or public sculptures or things like that. So it was putting people um, who had these different talents to work. Social Security was created as we know it um, today. It's of arguably it's running out and there's controversy surrounding whether or not it should continue or it should be expanded. But Social Security was put in place so that people, once they hit a certain age, they could stop working and retire and they could be taken care of in order to get those people out of the workplace and allow younger generations to come in and continue to work. And then the NLRA came in and basically said that workers have a right to unionize and that nothing would happen to them if they chose to exert that right. However, um, as we see Pre President Roosevelt pushing through these sweeping reforms and basically just kept saying, we're going to change this and this and this and this and this. Initially, there was there was very limited oversight on what he was doing because there was such a 
um, need and a desire to get these reforms out to pull the country out of the grips of the depression. And we know that really the depression fully ended once we entered World War II, but these were all of Roosevelt's efforts to try and get us there before the war became a reality for us. Um, so eventually things slowed down and the country started getting out of this, this place of depression and things were starting to look up a little bit. And the Supreme Court then started to come into play and started taking cases that were affected by FDR's uh, different um, executive orders and things that he would push through. And basically, in a couple of the cases that we're going to run through over the next couple minutes, um, a lot of the things that FDR's administration was putting through were then slapped down and SCOTUS said that they were unconstitutional because the president is overreaching his bounds. So in the first one, we have the Panama Refining Company v. Ryan out of 1935. And basically what this case was about, FDR had put quotas on um, the amount of oil products that companies could ship across state lines. And he did this in order to stabilize prices. So at the time, it was necessary for this to happen because they needed that stabilization of oil prices. However, um, what it turns out to be is that once you stop the amount of oil that can be shipped across the state line, you are basically violating the interstate commerce clause. And the federal government does not have the ability to say, this is, you know, they cannot put quotas. They don't have the power to set limitations of how much can go across state lines. And this basically served no legitimate purpose other than a monetary one in trying to stabilize the, stabilize the price of oil. So in this case, the Supreme Court ruled that this, this was a breach of presidential authority and that the executive office did not have the right to limit or set guidelines on what could cross state lines this was, again, a breach of the Interstate Commerce, Commerce Clause, and this was an effort to freeze the free market. Um, so this part of the National Industrial Recovery Act of 1933 was shut down, and the Supreme Court ruled it to be unconstitutional because it was this overreach of executive power. In the next case, I want to talk about the Scheckler uh, Poultry Corporation v. United States, also from 1935. This was a case that um, included price fixing and wage fixing. And this was a case that talked about the requirements that were put in place regarding um, the sale of whole chickens. And it was very limited on, I, I guess what I'm, I'm trying to get to is that the what they considered to be a whole chicken or a healthy chicken was very lenient. So they would allow unhealthy chickens to be sold. And they and this government allowed, um, the government allowed the regulations on the poultry industry to sort of be alleviated. And this company, the Schlechter um, Poultry Corporation was selling sick poultry. And we know this to be, um, we call this the sick chicken case now. And basically what it looked at was that the Supreme Court stepped in and said that this was an, they needed to invalidate the regulations um, because the, the federal government, and again, in this case, the executive branch did not have the right to go in and set these different um, guidelines on price and wage fix fixing and did not have the right or the ability to tell companies what they should or should not be doing. So this again was invalidated by the Supreme Court because it was uh, vi violate, no, excuse me, I'm sorry, violating the Interstate Commerce Clause once again and was part of FDR's New Deal legislation under the uh, NIRA ruling that again unconstitutional. So this is really a case about like the previous one in which the federal government has tried to step in and has tried to limit a free market economy. Um, Congress and the president in this case once again overstepped their bounds and um, in setting maximum work hours and setting the right for unions to organize and telling companies what they can and cannot do, they're not allowed to do that as part of their um, executive power. 
So this was a really big blow to the FDR administration and a big blow to his New Deal legislation um, because the NIRA was one of the biggest parts of the New Deal. So when it came out and this ruling did not go on the side of Roosevelt, it was basically a horrible blow for the New Deal as a whole um, because the NIRA was, was set up as a way to basically regulate the economy and trade and production for a lot of different industries. And it was meant to only be this emergency stopgap. Um, but then the government really put a larger emphasis on the NIRA than they really should have. And because the entire NIRA was then ruled unconstitutional, a lot of other programs that Roosevelt was trying to put through then were not allowed to be branched off in the way that he wanted them to be. So that sort of brings us to our next case of the Railroad Retirement Board versus Alton Railroad Company also in 1935. So the, fir the previous two cases were 1935 as well. So it was now becoming a bigger and bigger year for Roosevelt. Um, so basically what this case was about was the fact that the railroad pension was created as a way to encourage um, older railroad ro older railroad workers to be able to retire um, because the railroad industry at the time was a pretty dangerous job and the older that the railroad workers got um, the company sort of saw them as more of a liability and as a as a safety hazard in, in, a, in a way so by creating this pension and allowing these older workers to retire they then created new jobs for younger railroad workers who were very much in need of work and needed careers um, so congress passed this law that allowed or sort of mandated in a way that the railroad companies would have to create this pension as an effort to get the older workers out as a safety measure. So again, part of the New Deal, um, and it also sort of had its roots in Social Security, but was a little bit different because it was geared specifically towards railroad workers in, in um, a more specific sense. So before this case made it all the way up to the Supreme Court, um, a lot of challenges were filed in surrounding states and injunctions were issued on the grounds that the law was unconstitutional, but it wasn't until 1935 that the Supreme Court actually heard it. So in 1935, um, there was a five to four opinion issued by the court and it basically told the government once again that what they were doing was unconstitutional because there was no rationale or no real reason to um, suggest that this law really was about safety when really it was again about a monetary issue. So they ruled it un unconstitutional and the court at the time basically said that it was a naked appropriation of private property and that the federal government was trying to step in and force its hand on private industry. And that basically you cannot take company belongings in this, in this sense, it's the pension, the money that they're trying to give to the older workers. You cannot step in and take um, the money from the company, give it to the railroad, older rail, rail oh, I'm sorry, railroad <laughs> workers, um, because it was a violation of the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment. So you cannot do that. It's an, again, once again, an overreach of FDR's um, presidential powers and the congressional powers that surround private industry. So another hard blow to Roosevelt and his administration, but we're not just done yet. So the same year, this is now four in the same year, and there's a lot more that we haven't even gotten to, but for the purposes of this lecture, I'm just going to focus on one more. Um, so basically in the last case that we're going to review, Louisville Joint Stock Land Bank versus Radford of 1935, this is basically a case that focused on one specific family's farm. And in the early 20s, um, the Radford family had taken out a mortgage on a family farm in Kentucky. But after the depression hit hard, um, the Radfords basically went into foreclosure and they were encouraged by their bank to refinance their mortgage under the Emergency Farm Mortgage Act. 
um, but they were declined because they were going into defor into foreclosure. So the bank basically declined their refinancing offer and they declared that the mortgage that was left to be paid um, was in default. So very quickly, here come the repo men and they repoed the family's car or family's farm rather. So in 1934, shortly after the family had finally been repossessed, the federal government passes what they call the Fraser Lemke Emergency Mortgage Act. Um, and you can see that at the bottom of the screen here. And it was basically designed to give bankrupt families um, who were on farms financial aid, and it gave them the opportunity to buy their farms back from the bank. So the Radford family petitioned twice under this new act in an attempt to um, gain some relief from the federal government, but they were declined, they denied, they were denied because this Fraser Lemke Act was ruled unconstitutional. So eventually the Radfords were given the exemption um, that they were looking for after an appraiser looked at the land and they agreed that the couple would be eligible for the five-year exemption. However, by time it got to, to the Supreme Court, now it became an issue of constitutionality. Um, so earlier the court had ruled that the law was unconstitutional because it was a violation of the bank's Fifth Amendment rights. You cannot go in and try and give farms back to families after the bank had already taken them away legally. Um, so basically what the Supreme Court said was that the government had good intentions in trying to get farmers back on the, their land, but if you allow the company to be able to use the property for more than five years and the bank does not receive any sort of compensation, that's a violation of the free market economy as well, and that's unconstitutional. So another effort by the FDR administration to try and get people back into their properties um, turns out to be unconstitutional. So a lot of the things that we're seeing here all have a common theme. There's an overreach of the government in trying to get um, the economy stimulated back again, and they're doing it with good intentions, but their efforts in which they're doing it through turn out to be not so great and are largely a violation of the Interstate Commerce Clause and a violation of the free market economy. So, uh, FDR now has gotten four blowbacks that we've talked about and there's been many others that have come along and basically once um, the Supreme Court does this to him a final time, um, FDR basically decides that he is going to make things go his way and he's basically going to upset SCOTUS. And when I say that, um, he basically asks Congress for the opportunity to appoint six new justices um, as a way to influ infuse new blood into the court. And so Congress says, what are you, are you kidding me? Why are you going to, why do you want to do this other than the fact that you want justices to rule in your own favor? So they deny him the ability. And basically what his plan was that he said, if you happen to be over the age of 70, I'm going to replace you and you would get full retirement and full pay, but I'm basically going to force you out. Um, if you decline to retire, you could continue to still work, but basically I don't trust you to rule in the way that I want you to rule in my favor, obviously. So if you want to keep working, that's fine, but I'm going to then assign you an assistant justice and that person would be the one to vote instead of the older justice who was over 70 years old. Um, so in a happy coincidence, after um, the Congress basically said, you're, you're, you're joking, this is never going to happen for you, um, in a happy coincidence, over the next handful of years, FDR basically was allowed to court pack only because justices would retire or would pass away. Um, so in a happy coincidence, at least for him, he was able to reappoint eight out of the nine new justices that were needed on the court by 1941. And this worked out very well for him because the very in 1941 is when Pearl Harbor happened and we entered the war and he would need a Supreme Court that was on his side to be able to help pass new programs and would, he would need them to be able to make the war transition go as smoothly as possible, at least from his perspective. Um, so 
I guess, moral of the story for FDR was just be patient and you eventually will get what you want. But the purpose of this lecture is to show that there is obviously a sort of disconnect between the judiciary system and the executive branch of government and that these checks and balances are definitely needed in order for somebody to review what the or what the executive branch is doing. Um, and I felt like this was an appropriate time to talk about judicial review in an initial sense um, because we are about to really get into it in the next couple of weeks. And I also felt like given the current political climate and the large discussion of who's going to fill the vacant Supreme Court seat that Justice Scalia left behind when he passed away, I felt like it was an appropriate time to talk about what happens when the court and the um, executive branch are not necessarily always on the same side. So in your readings and in your, your analytical writing that you have due to me this week, these are some of the things that you should be thinking about as we go along. And next week, when we talk about, um, I guess, this continuation of the federal judiciary and in week three, the later discussion of judici uh, ju jurisdiction and the policy making boundaries that are set by state and federal governments, you really need to be thinking about how judicial review takes a precedent role in the application of, of these policy making ideas and how the government interacts with the judicial system. Um, so this is sort of the idea that I want you guys to be thinking about while you are creating your weekly topic um, lectures for me, your weekly topic recordings, and later your, your um, Supreme Court presentations. I want you guys to be focusing on some of the details and how they apply to the larger scheme of things while still staying consistent with the actual topic for the week. Um, so if you guys have any questions about how I created this lecture or how I was thinking about things as I created it, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me, especially those who are signed up for the next couple of weeks because next week and week two we are jumping right into the idea that you guys are going to take the reins and you're going to take them very quickly. Um, so let me know if anybody has any questions or any comments about this. I'll be happy to talk to you about it. Um, and if not, then I look forward to the readings that you guys are going, or I'm sorry, the, the papers and the discussion boards that you guys are going to uh, submit to me. And I will see you guys in week two when I give you another short little mini lecture. So good luck with all the work and I will talk to you soon. Thanks guys, bye.